come join me on January 27th at 7 p.m. Central, where Joel and I are going to be live and examining the feasibility of their retirement plan and poking around for risks and opportunities. This is your chance to see the analysis and also ask questions. You can register at livewithroger.com. Do you want to have the confidence to truly rock retirement? Well, I'm going to show you how on the Retirement Answer Man Show. Welcome to the show. Welcome to 2022. <laughs> My name is Roger Whitney. I am your host. We got a big month ahead of us. We got a big year ahead of us. I know in February, we're going to spend a whole month on inflation. What it is, how much should we worry about it, and how do we manage that risk? That's going to be exciting. But this month is our next installment of Retirement Plan Live, our live case study with a listener. We had an amazing number of submissions, and we selected Joel and Mike to share a little bit of their story with you throughout the month. So the way this is going to work is today, you're going to hear Joel and Mike's story and talk about their very recent retirement and their thought process to relocating to another state when they retired. And then throughout the month, you're going to hear more of their story as we create this profile, this framework to determine how feasible the retirement goals are and some risks and opportunities that perhaps they should focus on. So you're going to get to meet them today. I'm excited about that. And just before that, we're going to have Kevin Lyles, our head retirement coach on from the Rock Retirement Club. And I'm excited to announce, by the way, Kevin shared this with me. Let me find this text he said. This is pretty cool. That he was named as one of the top 20 retirement coaches for 2022 by the Coach Foundation. That's pretty cool. So excited for Kevin. Well earned, by the way. So that's what we got on deck today. Now, what before we get to our chat with Kevin in Coach's Corner, I want to make a quick correction. About a month ago, I answered a question on when you should stop health savings account contributions as you approach age 65 and get to Medicare. And I, I answered it very unclearly. I think I did do a good job. And James emailed me and some others pointed out, hey, Roger, I don't know if you got that one right. So I want to make a correction. So when you are making health savings account contributions, because you have a high deductible insurance policy, and you're approaching age 65, if you are enrolling in Medicare on your birth date, then you are allowed to make health saving account contributions. That's a pro rata portion of what the annual limit is. So if you are born, let's say July 1st, and you're going to enroll in Medicare and on your birthday in July 1st, when you're 65, you should be able to make a six-month contribution, so a pro rata portion or one half of what the annual limit is. So I appreciate you pointing that out. It's only if you're going to delay taking Medicare that it becomes a little bit more complicated. So I'm sorry for the confusion there. And with that, let's move on and chat with Kevin Lyles, one of the top 20 retirement coaches for 2022. Now we got Kevin Lyles, head retirement coach of the Rock Retirement Club. Kevin, how are you doing? Doing great, Roger. Now, we're about to be introduced to our subject for Retirement Plan Live right after you and I chat a little bit. And today, they're going to share a little bit about how they got to where they are from a life perspective, and then also turn around and cast forward of where they think they want to go in this next phase of life. How does one actually do that? Yeah, that's a big one. And I know you spend a lot of time with your clients, getting them to dream about their ideal retirement life and help them figure out which of their goals they can afford. And I really wanted to talk today about how folks who aren't working with a financial advisor can do this and can let the non-financial side of retirement inform their retirement financial plan. I think too often people get lost and just they figure out what they're spending before they retire and they just project that forward. And that really ignores the fact that your life is really going to change a lot when you retire. You're going to have a lot of extra time. You're going to have time for more activities and frankly, more spending. 
So I like to use what the accountants call zero-based budgeting. And I've got a sort of a five-step plan for people who are thinking of retiring to come up with that retirement budget that gives them the non-financial retirement life that they want. All right. Well, you have steps. Let's. I guess we start with number one. That would make sense. Step number one is to start with what I call the two big decisions. That is where you'll live and whether you'll work or at least earn some income in retirement. Because these two decisions really have a big impact on your retirement budget. And once you've answered these two questions, you can start to build that budget out. You know, where you'll live doesn't just affect your housing costs, it affects your overall cost of living and the activities that you'll be doing at different times a year. So I like to start with that one. And and once you know that, then you can start to build that budget out. And then if you're going to work, that has not only the financial impact of earning a paycheck, but it also affects the time you're going to have for other things. So those two questions are step one, answer those two, and then we get to step two. And so like where you're going to live seems that's a multifaceted question, right? Will I live in Texas or Colorado? Will I live in the city or in the country? All of those, there's a lot of sub points under there that help you get a sense of the environment that you're creating for yourself, right? That's exactly right. And most retirees are going to stay where they are. The numbers tell us that. But a lot of people sort of have a goal to maybe move closer to the kids or to move closer to some activity that they like. So that's why I call it one of the big decisions because it has such a big impact on your spending. And, you know, if you're as I did, I moved from Ohio to Florida when I retired. That's a big change in cost of living. And so had I just looked at what I was spending in Ohio, it wouldn't have given me a very good estimate of what I might spend in retirement. There's a lot more water where you live. So I'm assuming your golf ball cost has really skyrocketed. My golf ball cost did, but you know what? The beach is free. So (laughs) I got a lot of time that I can spend for free. Those beach walks, they don't charge a thing for those. (laughs) And so start to think, and that's really about creating your environment, right? Is what kind of environment do you see yourself in? And then the work part makes sense from a time perspective. I didn't think about it from that sense. I always think about the money side, right? Oh yeah, it'll, it'll make everything easier if someone works, but it changes how you, your rhythm of your day. It really does. It changes a lot. And you know, we've talked before about a lot of the benefits you can get from working part-time in retirement, but it really will affect your budget a good deal. Let me ask you a question on that real quick. Is it important to think of these two things? And this is hard for some, if I could have it what I want. It seems hard for people to imagine that they could do something different, whether it's because they want to be reasonable for planning purposes. How do you get past that? Any ideas? (laughs) It is hard. And you're right, because people just imagine their life continuing the way it has been without work. And that's really what we retirement coaches like to do is to nudge people a little bit and get them thinking big and dreaming about their ideal retirement life. Okay. All right. So number step two. Step two. And this is a big one because here you need to decide what your three to five core activities in retirement are going to be. These are the things you're going to build your retirement life around. The things that bring you meaning and purpose. You know, we talk all the time about that. It's Perhaps they're hobbies or family activities. Maybe you're going to start a business or maybe you're going to volunteer. Whatever the three to five things that are really going to drive your retirement life, you need to plan for those and then figure out what they're going to cost you to do them. Like I say, some things don't cost anything. Some cost a lot. You need to dream big, figure out what would you like to build your retirement life around, which activities, and then you can build those into your budget. And that really coincides with where you're going to live, right? I think of myself because it's, you know, I live in my head, so it's all about me. That's how we work, right? (laughs) I love to mountain bike and my wife too. She loves to hike. Well, here where we live, I have to drive 40 minutes to get to a bicycle trail. And it's North Texas. It's not mountain. (laughs) It's North (laughs) Texas. And she likes to hike. Same thing. Whereas Colorado, it literally hiking and mountain biking, going on the water, all right outside our door, which it takes away the friction of doing the things that we actually enjoy. So that's part of, 
it sort of goes together with where you live, setting yourself up to do the things that you love. That's exactly right. That's why we started with that first big question, because whereas now hiking and mountain biking, you may do three or four times a year in retirement. If you move to Colorado, you may do it every day because it's so easy three or four times a week. Right. Right now, the fridge is right there. So it's so easy. So I just eat. (laughs) (laughs) That's exactly (laughs) right. And if you're a golfer and you're going to golf more, well, golf has a cost associated with it. So that's why you really need to think about what are these core activities that you're going to build your life around and then price them out. And kids could be one of those core activities or grandkids, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we're talking about some sort of extravagant things that cost a lot. They really don't have to. Babysitting grandkids may be one of your core activities, and that may come at very little or no cost, or maybe your kids are going to pay you something to do that. So it can work a lot of ways in your budget, but you just need to figure out what these core activities are and then figure out what their cost will be to you. Thinking back to the subject of Retirement Plan Live a couple of years ago, and I can't recall the name that we gave her because we always change people's names. And she lived with her husband on a very rural country place. And I think she was talking about how he was working on chicken coops and chicken pens and everything else, but they structured their life that was served what they wanted to be outdoor with the animals. And it cost next to nothing because I remember people were really shocked by that. I can't recall what her name was, but that's an example of it, I think. Yeah. There are ways to live a wonderful life that costs very little. And there are ways to live a lousy life that caused a lot. So you just need to figure out what it's going to be for you. Okay. So once we've done these two steps, where do we go from here? So step three is to decide on the things that are going to make retirement really special for you. This is where you really dream, live out your dreams, apply your unique gifts and talents. For some, this is going to include travel. Others, maybe it's a home improvement or a boat or an RV purchase. Whatever is really in your dreams about retirement. I think of Fritz's wife, Retirement Manifesto blog. She started a small nonprofit where they build fences for homes for dogs. Right, that's a good, yes. that's a good example of it, right? Yeah, and in, in their case, that's really one of their core activities, right? And probably also fulfills a dream of really helping out. So these categories obviously aren't mutually exclusive, but Here, I'm really talking about the things that maybe you're not going to do them every day, but it's just something you've always wanted to do. Maybe you've wanted to learn about a subject, and so you're going to enroll in a college course to learn more about that. There are just lots of dreams we have about retirement or things we've always thought, I'd like to do that when. Well, guess what? You're at the when now in life, and so I want you to think about those. Be creative. You get to write your own story in retirement, so write it down, and then you can start to create a budget for fulfilling those dreams. Let me ask you a question about this, because I was thinking about this just today. Retirement and choosing where you're going to live, choosing activities, and choosing meaningful things to do, all of those things require us to disrupt the status quo. And the status quo is, even if we're stressed, tired, not happy, is very, very comfortable at a level that's consciously, but very unconsciously too. I guess the first step is just to acknowledge that, hey, this is change and that's scary. What do we do? And different people are going to be able to do that at different levels. For some of us, change is exciting and we can jump right in, while others of us, it is scary. And so we have to wade in, put our toe in first, and then sort of ease into it. And some won't do it immediately. They'll try out retirement for a while, and then maybe they'll get bored, and then they'll start adding some of these things to their life. So we're all different. That's what makes life interesting. Now, you had a pretty well thought out plan. I'm guessing it wasn't a big deal for you, disrupting status quo. Well, I thank you for saying that, but I don't agree. I think I figured it out on the fly. I hadn't done nearly as much planning. When I think now about how I think about planning for the non-financial side of retirement, I'm so much better than I was four years ago. But yeah, change comes easy. I'm not against change and it doesn't scare me. I usually jump in. And one thing you've got to realize here is you don't need to plan for the next 30 to 40 years of your life. 
you plan for the next five and then, as you say, iterate from there, remain agile. And so that's really what I'm trying to do. The things I'm doing now that I absolutely love doing, I don't know if I'll be doing them five years from now. I think that's really important. So that's a good point, Kevin, is that's one reason why I like the Agile Project is you're constantly lifting your head out of the water to realign yourself. Do I still care about this? And if not, you change directions. And that gives you a lot of outs to absolutely not feel like you're, you're going. Okay. I didn't mean to derail you there, Kevin. So no, that's okay. We're up to step four All right. of our five-step plan. So step four is to plan for the day-to-day activities that are going to fill your calendar and fill your days. Now I'll just give you my list of the ones that I, that come to mind. Gym memberships. I have gym memberships that I go exercise. I have golf fees. We go to football and hockey games as spectators. I have those tickets. We have season tickets for those sports. We have several theater subscriptions that we like to go to. And then we schedule regular dinners and lunches with friends and family. So all of those things sort of fill up my day-to-day life in retirement. And we have to figure out what that list is and what it's going to cost and price them out. Again, we're still dreaming about retirement life here. We don't have to settle on anything because ultimately we have to look at what resources we have available. And I know that's what you help your clients do, but that's what a do-it-yourselfer needs to do. I imagine that it would be wise to consider the seasons when you're thinking about these actual activities, right? Football season has a season, right? It's, you know, the fall to just, now it's going into winter, but, and then when that season ends, so you can have some rhythm. So you're not in a season of just actual seasons where there's nothing that you are really excited about. Does that make sense? Yeah, it sure does. And when budgeting for these things, I think of them as sort of an annual expense, Mm -hmm. but you're absolutely right. The non-financial side or just the day-to-day retirement life it really does matter what season you're in. As you know, I spend time in Florida and in Ohio. And so I have very different lives that I live in both places. I enjoy them both, but it really does change how you live. Very good point. Okay. So our fifth and final step. Final step is, and this is the boring part, it's to add in all those other expenses that we have. And this is where you can probably look to some extent to what you're spending now, things like health care, insurance, utilities, taxes, food, clothing, transportation, household expenses, all those things that make up our budget. If you've been tracking your expenses, you can just pull some of these amounts over into your retirement budget. The things I think we forget in that a lot of times, Kevin, are that I've seen is those extraordinary things, the hot water heater, Busted, need a new one of those. This happened. All these extraordinary things that lie about them is that they always happen and they can really inflate a budget if we don't have that in there in some way. Yeah, I have a category in our budget for unexpected, or actually it's not unexpected. It is expected home maintenance, things that just come up. And then automobiles, you don't spend on those every year, but when you do, it's usually a pretty big expense. So Yeah, we need to create a line item in our budget for those. I think that's a great framework. And I think we can go meet our subject for Retirement Plan Live and and start to draw this out in them and see where it goes. I'm anxious to hear this year's story. This episode is sponsored by LTCI Partners. The cost of extended health care is a risk to confidently rocking retirement, and they provide insurance solutions to help manage this risk. The fact is that health care insurance, even through the ACA or Medicare, were never designed to cover the type of expenses you would have in the event of a long-term care event. Doing some proper planning in managing this risk can help you make your retirement plan more resilient and give you a couple of things that are pretty important, I think. One, that can help you have more choices in the type and setting of care you receive, so more control, and help your loved ones maintain their emotional and financial well-being. You can learn more at ltcipartners.com forward slash R-A-M, where you can learn the basics about how to manage this long-term care risk. (laughs) 
So now it's time to meet Joel of Joel and Mike, who has graciously agreed to be our subject for this month. So we're going to have a chat and you're going to get to understand the dynamics of her and Mike and their financial relationship as a being longtime married couple, but also the transition that they recently made. Now we're going to build this with Joel. So she'll be on the show this entire month. And as a reminder, we're going to have a live meetup via a webinar format where Joel will be on with me live and you, where we're going to share the feasibility of the retirement plan that we'll be talking through this month. So you'll see financially how feasible this is. And then we'll poke around for some opportunities and some risks that perhaps they should focus on. And you're going to have the chance to ask questions and be there with us. So if you want to join us, it's going to be January 27th. That's a Thursday at 7 p.m. Central. And you just go to livewithroger.com and you can learn more and register. And even if you can't attend and you want the replay, if you register, we'll be sending out a replay. And so with that, let's meet Joelle. Welcome to the show, Joelle. Thank you for having me. So I'm curious, why did you raise your hand for this in the first place? Well, I was listening to your podcast and I heard you kind of putting out feelers for looking for one of your listeners to come on to be your subject for 2022 for live retirement planning. And I had just recently retired and my husband and I were going through so many changes at once. And I felt relatively prepared for retirement. And then when we actually pulled the trigger, I got kind of panicked. And I thought that maybe that was an experience that possibly some of your other listeners had had as well. I also just wanted to get your eyes on our situation to see, did we pull the trigger too soon? Um, I've got fears about everybody's fear, right? Running out of money too soon before you die. But on the other end of that spectrum, thinking about, am I going to live too small of a life? And it was interesting to me because I had never thought about that fear before. And it came real once we did this. So I decided to just raise my hand and glad the teacher picked me. Ah. (laughs) The visual that I had in your mind about when she pulled the trigger, all of a sudden it was like, (gasps) it made me think of standing in line as a kid for a roller coaster. And while you're in line and usually you're waiting an hour, you can always get out and you're sort of, yeah, do I do it? Do I not? Do I do it or not? And everything else. But then once you get strapped in and you just start to go up the hill, you realize I can't stop this now. hundred percent. hundred percent. That's a perfect analogy. And then it's interesting how diametrically opposed making sure you have a big enough life and then still being okay later on. (laughs) They Mm -hmm. are, right? Mm-hmm, exactly. So let's talk a little bit about your dynamic. So you are married to Mike, and obviously these aren't your real yes. names. Yes. So how long have you two been married? It will be 27 years on Saturday. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Assuming you get there, because it's not Saturday yet. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been married 27 years, and how, can I ask how old the two of you are? Yes, I'll be 60 next month, and my husband is 65. Okay. Okay. And now you are the primary manager of all things finance, correct? I remember you telling me that. 100%. So I tell people that, yes, we've been married for 27 years, but I've been single when it comes to budgeting, financial planning, retirement planning. We grew up in very opposite money households, and it just has not been something that was taught to him nor did he have an interest in it. So creates a great level of anxiety for me and stress because I feel like it all falls to me. And have I been doing due diligence in my planning? And if I take him down with me, you know, so I (laughs) I really have these stressors about when it comes to retirement and I feel like we're okay, but it's certainly something that is a goal of mine to pull him into the loop a little bit more and get him involved. So when you say you have different money styles, why don't we start with you? What is your style as the financial manager? I am frugal and a saver to a fault. Okay. Which is interesting because I grew up in a household that was not stressed with money. My parents never talked about money 
but I felt no underlying stress. Everything we needed was provided for us. My husband on the other side grew up the oldest of 10 children, extremely poor, first generation in U.S. He literally began working at the age of five, doing small part-time work in order to help feed the family. He is a spender. Huh. Why do you you think that, have you always been frugal? Let me start there, I guess. Yes. Yes. Well, I wonder, do you have any, any insights as to why you think? It just is safety to me. And I think maybe the fact that my parents would not discuss money or how much they made or what things cost. So I didn't have a realistic view of what was necessary. So I think my default was just to save just in case, because I don't know, I'm not educated about this. And then since your husband's not here, we can talk about him. <laughs> why? No, just kidding. Thank goodness. <laughs> so he, why do you think he has his view on money? Any thoughts from your 27 years together? I think that going without for so long, once he got any level of money, he has viewed that as wealth versus just getting by. And so he just will see a shiny object and buy it. He literally one time years ago went to a hardware store to buy a ladder and he came home with a brand new pickup truck. Swear to God. (laughs) Okay. That is, uh, yeah. So, so our yin yang is a little different. Interesting. Shall I say? Yeah. So in some ways, that's a compliment. You can compliment each other, right? If you he pulls you one direction a little bit, you pull him another direction. How have you two managed such different philosophies? It's been a real challenge, to be honest with you. I know that I'm overly frugal, and so I try to just let it go. And we've kept some separate money. And I think that that's helped me psychologically as I look at it like, okay, he just spent that money but I didn't see it come out of our joint account. So I think that that's how I've had to wrap my head around it. Now that our money is more intertwined and becoming more intertwined as we're getting into retirement, it could be a potential challenge for us in the future. So how has it impacted you once you've both retired? Because before financial missteps or spending were covered by current or future income. Yes, yes. And there has been a few of those. So that felt nice having that buffer and that buffer's gone now. So how are you dealing with that? Well, we're only six months into retirement. I'll have to let you know. (laughs) (laughs) Jerry is still out. How is he viewing that with the change? He doesn't think about it. I don't think since retiring just in the six months, there have been some what in my eyes are relatively large purchases. He, he bought a classic car. He bought a riding lawnmower. He bought a couple of e-bikes. And so we're, I think that as we go through this process with you, this is going to be very helpful in opening up some nice conversation windows for him and I to have. Yes. In a productive way. Because we just want our best life. Yeah. We want our best life together, be able to plan have a budget, have better communication, and be on it together. Okay. And how involved is he or does he want to be in figuring this retirement thing out? Is he willing to engage with you on that? Do you mean as far as the process working with you or as far as just retirement overall? How you're going to cover all your spending and the process? Because you're going to be managing this process on your own. So is he a helper in that or is he like, I don't want to talk about it? He doesn't want to talk about it, although we did have one conversation when we first came up here, so I could at least tell him, you know, if something happens to me, this is here, this is here, this is here, this is what you do. I think that I am going to need to write it down because, as you know, these things aren't something you hear once and they stick. It's a learning process. So I feel like he's open to coming into the process more, but I think it's going to be a slow ride. Yeah, I know you've articulated and you mentioned it briefly. And then in our private conversation we had, which was, it's a lot of pressure on you to get it right. Incredible. It keeps me up at night. Okay. Literally keeps me up at night. Well, hopefully we can help a little bit with that. I hope so. 
So now you two lived in L.A. Mm -hmm. My husband was born and raised, lived in L.A. his entire life. I was there for the last 30 years. So we moved from a town of 3.9 million to a town in Washington of 8,000. So tell me what your life was like in L.A. Oh, it was busy. It was busy. We have three children and most of the time, two living at home. I have an older stepdaughter, but uh, my husband and I have two together and they were busy, busy, busy kids. So we were busy, busy, busy parents. We luckily both co-owned businesses. And so we had a lot of flexibility. Our kids were hugely into sports, travel sports. So that was like a, another part-time job for us. I was a pediatric occupational therapist for 38 years. My husband had a landscaping business. And so we both were, you know, when you are your own business owner, as you know, it's 24 seven, you're not done at five o'clock. So super busy. His whole family was there. We had a great social connection. We were very, very involved with our friends, our friends, friends kind of had one of those houses where it was the place the kids liked to come and hang till they got older. We were a little stricter. So once they got <laughs> a little older, it wasn't their house anymore. So had an equestrian property. So my husband spent a lot of time horse riding and it was great, busy, busy life. But in all honesty, we were done with California. We were just done. We wanted something new. We wanted seasons. We wanted smaller. We wanted slower. When I think of LA, you sort of threw me a loop and you said equestrian property because I, I haven't spent a lot of time in LA. And when I have, it's been urban. Yes. Or I think of well, urban and traffic. Yes, you are correct. We were in this very small pocket of the urban trafficy area. Okay. <laughs> and they called it country living in the city. All right. So it was just a small area, but it was still right in the thick of it. And you just moved within the last year, correct? Yes, yeah, six months ago. Okay. I'm interested in how did you even think about that? Because it sounds like you had a lot of friends, you had mm -hmm. a huge network of family and friends mm -hmm. and things that you were doing, how did you imagine something different? Well, we had spent time in Pacific Northwest, which we just really fell in love with. And we're looking for a place where we could have some seasonal changes, but not the constant rain. And just through research and stalking the different cities and areas up here, we found this little pocket that gets the same rainfall as Los Angeles on an annual basis. And we narrowed it down to a couple of areas and we visited, but it was a lot like throwing a dart at a map. I spent a lot of time watching cultural events, restaurants, real estate, weather, and believe it or not, we only came up here once before really? we actually per yes yes now i had been to this larger metropolitan area in washington many 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 times but i knew that that was what i was looking for but i feel like i had spent so much time online that i felt i knew this community in some ways and we got here and i did share with you when we were just talking off air privately that we literally bought this house without ever stepping foot into it. We just toured it virtually. And it has been 10 times better than we could have ever expected. We absolutely love it here. Our neighbors are amazing. The people that we've connected with so far are amazing. And I still feel like it's fake, like it can't be this good, but it's wonderful. So no regrets whatsoever. So Joelle, there's a lot to unpack there. Let's see. I stalked the community online. I visited Washington, although you've been in the area once, the area that you're in, and you bought the house sight unseen other than virtually. Wow, you two are bold. So was there, you're both on, obviously both on board with this. Talk about how you navigated leaving your community. That, that was the hardest part because we were very connected. The way that we look at it as we're free time-wise, a city. We can travel back. It was interesting because COVID put an interesting twist on it. I had never heard of Zoom before. And now I get together with my friends back in Los Angeles for, you know, 
virtual happy hours or meetups or whatever, and I still feel very connected to them, is it the same as going out to lunch with them or going on a hike with them? No, but I feel like we've got time where we can go visit them or we can say, let's meet up for vacation here. And again, it's only been six months, so it hasn't felt that odd to us yet, but it's been having Zoom and having that social connection opportunity has been extremely helpful. So I guess that's the one uh, one positive I can take away from the last two years in COVID. Yeah, and I, I guess that makes a little bit of an emotional bridge while you establish the new network. Yes, 100%. And also our middle daughter moved to New York City the same week that we moved here. And we have a son who was already in Utah in college. So we already were empty, empty nesters. Our oldest daughter is still in California, but nobody was in our town anymore. And I think having the kids launched really made it an easier decision for us. Yeah. Now, what about parents? Or did you have parents locally or where are they in the picture? Both of my parents have deceased and my father-in-law has deceased. My mother-in-law has pretty advanced Alzheimer's. And so in all honesty, although she was local, the visits with her had become very different. Yeah. And we felt very comfortable that she has many of her children still local to assist with her care. So I think everything just kind of fell into place where it made it a little easier for us to take that leap of faith. Yeah. With him having nine brothers and sisters, there's a still a good support network around her. <laughs> yes, there is probably larger than she'd like sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to explore in the last installment of this, this month, what your life is like right now in creating new communities. So that'll be fun. Okay. I'm excited about I'm that. Excited. Yeah. Yeah. As I was listening to you, and this is what I think all humans do. They apply it to themselves because we're all <laughs> at our core nature, you know, self-centered, you know, cause my wife and I, we, we have the same thing with Colorado though. We've been going, you know, going back and forth periodically and our kids are just about launched or pretty much launched and we have some land there and, exploring whether we do the same type of thing for a lot of the same reasons, right? Slower pace of life, mm -hmm. closer to nature and doing the things you want to be able to do. So very cool. Right. All right. I'm excited right. to dive into this. So right. next week, what we're going to do is we are going to talk about what you're forecasting for retirement, what living large in retirement or rocking retirement actually means from a conceptual standpoint and from a what the heck it's going to cost standpoint. So are you excited about that? I am very excited about that. That's the meat of it, right? That's the, that's how you create a <laughs> life. But for now, let's go set a smart sprint. On your marks, get set. And we're off to set a little baby step that we can take in the next seven days to not just rock retirement, but rock life. Now, here at the start of the new year, it's like begin again. Now we have to start again to a new year. And that theme of begin again is going to be something constant, just like in retirement planning. When you have a plan of record and you've made all these decisions, all of those decisions are going to have to be remade. It, planning is a process and it's a living thing. So you're always beginning again. Now, you're beginning again at a different level, right? Because even if you fail something, you've learned a lot. But in the next seven days, give yourself some grace about beginning again and just take every little baby step and realize it's a process. It's not a destination. I just wanted to thank everybody that sent me what their word is for the year. If you recall, I think, I think it was a few weeks back, my word was smooth, which I'm working on. We had words like intention and persistence and metamorphosis. I love these words. Now, the next step in that process, by the way, is finding something that that's a reminder. It could be a wristband. It could be something. What I am using, and I bought one for my son because I know he'd like it. I'm a big fan of stoicism. And this sounds a little morbid, but I have a coin, a medallion, I guess they call it. And on the front, it has a skull and it says, Memento Mori, remember death. Now that sounds sort of, bleh, 
But the idea is to cherish every moment. So that's my reminder. I keep it in my pocket. I hold on to it. I flip it. And it's my reminder to remember, live now. I hope you have a great week. Hey, it's time for that all important disclaimer. We so appreciate you listening to the show and love your questions and love the teaching that we're able to provide here. And actually it helps us too, but remember you're not our clients. Not love it. If you took advice from yeah, us, on we, the would show. Not, we would not love it. If you took advice from us on the show, realize this is helpful in an education, talk to your legal advisor, your tax advisor, or your financial advisor before you make any decisions. We appreciate you joining us today for this episode of retirement answer, man. Be sure to visit rogerwhitney.com slash answers to access the Retirement Answer Library with over 30 checklists to help you make the most of the only life you have. Remember, you have more power than you realize to create an amazing life starting today with Retirement Answer Man. The opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Have a wonderful day.